Okay, I need you to imagine in your mind the card that you have chosen. Really think about it. Okay, got it? Good. Now, I'm going to telepathically read that from your mind using my magician powers. Okay? okay I think I've got it. Is it, is it the Queen of Diamonds? No? Suppose I got it wrong then. Or did I? The Queen of Hearts. Not? Was I, was I close? Well, if you're so smart, then how about you be a magician? Anyway, I have something else to show you. So, before starting my newest illusion, making people think I'm a competent essay writer, and you know, if I, if I fail, if I mess up, it's okay because I'm pretending to be Job, so it would totally make sense. Um, but now I want to introduce some sort of ba some basic stuff. Um, also, massive spoiler warning. I will be discussing entirely spoiler-ridden content, and this is a really good show. So if you aren't one of my friends who I've already spoiled this to after not being able to resist talking about this show, then I'd suggest take you know watching the show first. Um, anyway, you've been warned. So here's the mother and the father of the family, George and Lucille Bluth. Um, then we have Job, who's the oldest brother. This is Michael and Lindsay, who are twins. And um, then we have Buster. Um, also, actually, technically, for spoiler of the video, she's technically not his twin. She's actually the oldest, but we're in this, in, to, not to their knowledge until much later in the show. So they think he is the old, so, you know, he old, oldest, twin, middle children, and youngest. Um, Michael and Lindsay each have kids, but we don't discuss them, and so that's why they're not here. And Job has a kid, and he doesn't know that until much later. Um, and uh, also, just saying this up front, since it's prevalent to my points, uh, I'm reading and interpreting Job as gay as opposed to bi. Um, I read a very well-written post um, talking about this fact, and I feel like it makes sense. So, and yeah, so that's the Job. So gay Job is who you're getting for this video. Anyway, that's all on, on with the content. Joe Bluth is the oldest sibling, a magician, and the so-called worst Bluth in the 2003-2019 series Arrested Development. Like all the other characters, he kept making the same mistakes and choices over and over again. He was always this irresponsible, inconsiderate mess who was desperate for love from all the wrong people. He was given wake-up call after wake-up call, but he, all he did was run away from his problems and destroy his life little by little. Until... One event that halted the cycle in his tracks. Job actually changes. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we delve into that, we have to know where Job started out. Job's behavior stems from his repression of self and need for approval. Job's dad, George Sr., can be simplified down to, you know, a businessman and a man who cheats on his wife, sleeps around with a lot of women. When it comes to, you know, the business side of things, Michael, Job's younger brother, was pretty much, you know, raised to be the eventual one to inherit the company. Job was pretty much the opposite, ignored and hated by his father. Because of the lack of support he got as a child and the support his brother Michael did get in, you know, in terms of their dad, Job is always jealous of the attention that he was deprived of. Job has no interest in the company, no interest in being in charge, no interest in the business side of things, but he does have interest in getting his father's approval. And Michael gets respect and praise by being in charge of the company, something their dad does. So he fills in when Michael does it. And if he can't be a businessman, you know, he's gotta be his, like, and he wants to be like his dad, he's, he'll be that in another aspect, a womanizer. His dad is shown in the present and in flashbacks cheating on his wife, Lucille. Job is also shown doing this exact behavior with Scratch, the having a wife part. Although he does have a wife on complications, but never good. Um, he brags about, you know, all the, all the women he sleeps with and tries to present himself as, you know, a person who gets a lot of women and he likes it. And he's like, yeah, I'm super cool. He's even shown on multiple occasions lying about sleeping with women just so he can, you know, slay, he's, say he slept with a woman. Um, most often he bra you know, his brags are directed towards Michael in order to, you know, prove that he, Job, is better. Look at all the women I sleep with. I'm better than you. 
Um, he doesn't have a company, you know, he can present and show off to seem impressive, so he shows off the women he sleeps with. He's shouting out, hoping to catch the attention of his father or his brother so they'll finally acknowledge his success. Um, he practically breaks down whenever his brother does show he cares, so, you know, his bragging is clearly him trying to get, you know, his family to love him. It's also shown to be a way of saying he's better than Michael, as I said, or an effort to prove that, you know, he is who he presents himself as. When a family meeting with their publicist takes place, and Michael is said to be one of the few intelligent, attractive, and straight men in this town, Job gets hung up on the fact that Michael's only slept with four women. Sure, Michael may be smart, but, you know, Job is the most straight because he gets the most women. He's desperate to convince others that this isn't a facade, so he sleeps with women or just lies about sleeping with a woman if he actually didn't in order to create a repertoire so he can point to if ever questioned. Being a straight guy who is very attracted to women is, par is a part of his father who he's trying to emulate, and he's convinced himself that this will make him happy. That this, because, you know, his father isn't a failure, and, you know, he did that, so he, Joe, must not be a failure either. And maybe one day, it'll make his father proud of him, and feeling like his facade is threatened, like, you know, oh no, what if people don't think that about me? What if, you know, so he goes to defend it by bringing up the fact that he slept with more women. Job always wants what Michael has, or rather, he wants for his father to, um, you know, not think he's a failure. And the only way to really get close to that is to be Michael, and that's not possible, so the closest hope at being Michael is obtaining what his brother possesses. Um, while Job was never intended and doesn't even want to be in charge of the company, he still expresses a want to be in charge. It's something he's seen, you know, has gotten Michael a guaranteed spot of respect. In the episode Top Banana, Job says, I should be in charge. I'm the older brother. And, you know, when Michael questions if he actually, you know, wants to be in charge, Job replies, no. But I'd like to be asked. You know, as stated, he doesn't have any real interest in that stuff, only wanting it because of the attention it would have gotten him from his father. Whenever he is made president, he never wants to do his job. He either lazes around or makes impressive claims for it to seem like he's doing a good job, um, typically, you know, taking it a step up from whatever his, whatever his brother Michael claimed was a good idea, which is never a good idea because Michael knows what he's talking about. Um, so he, fla he flaunts the company and a woman, if he's with one at the time, um, you know, hoping that someone will tell him he's doing a good job until it all falls apart under, under his poor management and Michael goes back to being in charge. And he's back being stuck as the goofball, the joker, the magician, having to gain his respect through the woman he sleeps with. On another instance in the episode The Cabin Show, Job learns that there's a family cabin he never knew about. Michael had never actually gone, um, he learned it from Michael, um, but, he, but Michael had never been to it. He always being promised by his father that they'd go before the trip, but, you know, it would be canceled last minute, his dad instead taking some woman, he, you know, to sleep with. After this, Job tells Michael, at least he promised to take you. I didn't even know there was a cabin he wasn't taking me to. Now crying and making Michael taste the sad. Michael was hurt by the promising and subsequent cancellation, you know, of every cabin trip. But Job is so desperate for any semblance of positive attention that he yearns for something as minuscule as having only the chance of spending quality time with his dad. Job tends to misinterpret his, his dad's life as successful. Somehow, his dad's clearly failing, failing marriage, the fact that he was sent to jail, and his sinking company aren't enough to get the message across that it isn't. You know, clearly. He always listens to his dad, thinking that he knows best, and that the life, you know, that he led is the kind of life Job needs to, you know, get in order to be respected, in order to be happy. In the episode Best Man for the Job, Joe is shown bending to whatever his dad says is right. You know, he admits that Garrett getting married to the woman he's seeing, who he doesn't even know the name of. He married her um, during a series of dares, does not know her name, doesn't know who she is really. Um, you know, he admits it was stupid, but only after, you know, talking to his dad and his dad told him it was. Michael, confused, responds, you know, I said two weeks ago that that was a stupid idea. You don't have to do everything dad says. Um, then later on, Joe goes back on this, you know, um, saying that he talked to dad and he thinks he should stay in it. Um, 
then adds on the fact that now he wants a bachelor party, his dad's request, as well as the fact that his dad is now the best man as instead of Michael. All throughout this episode, he's being led around by his dad, even after realizing that this isn't genuine interest, but part of one of his dad's schemes. You know, he's so desperate for attention that he's willing to use his bachelor party to get the company's accountant drunk and then make the company's accountant think he murdered a stripper. The stripper, like, falls asleep really easily, so they, you know, she looks like she's dead. And so, so the accountant will leave town and won't be able to testify against his father because, you know, if he's successful in doing this, maybe his father will finally love him. Maybe he won't be a failure because that's all he's been told that he was, you know? Well, to Job and his father's dismay, for different reasons, you know, things don't go according to plan. His dad, after being confronted about it by Michael, you know, angrily shouts, Job screwed it up, which he did and always does. And Job, when later talking to Michael, you know, he agrees, you know, he says, when he was my age, he ran an entire company, had kids. Michael reassures him, you know, bringing up the fact, you know, that his company is corrupt and his dad is constantly trying to drive them and his children apart. Michael, who was given, you know, the life that Job wished he had, can see that his dad is not a good person. But even after expressing this to Job, Job still is trying to appeal to his father, you know, do what he wants, as opposed to what, you know, he, Job, actually wants. You know, he still doesn't want to give up the chance, you know, at getting his dad's approval. He's convinced himself that this is the kind of life he wants, you know, and, you know, because his father let it, it was a good one. Um, not because he actually wants it or that his father was actually successful, you know, but because maybe then he won't be a failure. And, you know, that's where Job always gets stuck. Job's refusal to acknowledge his own faults and improve himself, which, you know, would require him having to acknowledge his father's faults, something he's in great denial of, while also striving for genuine connection that would, you know, require such a thing, is his curse. He's given chance after chance to realize what he's doing is wrong, but he never does. He never, you know, really ad admits to that. And, or rather, you know, he knows it's wrong. He knows. But he doesn't want to change because he's forever, he's afraid of being forever a failure, you know, in his father's eyes. He's afraid of being a failure in anyone's eyes, you know, but he doesn't want to have to think about the person he's become, so he tries to forget it. He forgets it or he runs away. You can tell he knows and feels immense shame, you know, for the life he leads. You know, he's, Job is always wanting others to clean up his messes so he doesn't have to deal with it himself. And when they can't, he resorts to his own ways of doing so. He's constantly taking, you know, forget me now pills. They're a, a pill that makes him forget now um, in order to, you know, try to get himself to forget his shame. You know, he blames the people who try to reach out to him when they call him out on his bad behavior and that pushes them away in the process. He's constantly running away from himself. You know, he's he was told all his life that he was a failure. And while a lot of that was undeserved, this has caused his reaction to any criticism to skew. He's trying so hard not to be the failure he was always told he was that he doesn't acknowledge when he's actually wrong. And that leads to him making bad decisions. You know, by season four, he's pushed everyone away. He's alone, you know, when calling his son, Steve Holt, to try and get him to help sabotage his magician rival, you know, to which Steve declines. Job says, you know what? You're mad at me. I get it. I totally get it. And guess what? I'm mad at you. And, you know, Steve, who was over and over again, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't know that Job didn't know he had a son. Steve didn't know Job was his dad. And, um, you know, they reconnected after a while. And, you know, after trying over and over and over again to connect with his dad, you know, he says, and after, after Job said that thing, says, you know, dad, that attitude might be why you're alone all the time. The way you treat people. Of course, Job just continues to get mad at Steve and continue to be in denial of the fact that he himself is the problem. All of these things I've mentioned, you know, that he pushes himself towards in life, don't make him happy. It's all an attempt at forming a real connection with his dad or, you know, anyone else who holds those values. But it's a fruitless effort, you know? He had a bad childhood, but that doesn't mean he has to keep wallowing and destroying his life because clearly, you know, he yearns for so much more. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, that would actually require improving himself as a person. 
he'd have to realize that what he's been trying to do for years was all a facade, and his parents don't love him, and they never will, and that's okay, you know? But he doesn't want to acknowledge that. He just wants to continue being mad at the world and making it someone else's problem, and pretending he's someone he's not, and ruining his life, perpetuating his unhappiness, so he pushes away the people who truly care. Um, he doesn't want to face the shame of his actions. He doesn't want to face who he truly is. He doesn't want to do the things his dad wouldn't approve of, and he'll never find the happiness he craves so much because of this. Just like the title of the show says, it's Arrested Development. The characters never develop, they never change. You know, he keeps running away from his responsibilities. He keeps running away from himself. He keeps striving for the approval of horrible people who will never tell him they love him because they don't. And, you know, he keeps denying himself, you know, happiness, even though he's given chance after chance after chance until he's pushed everyone who loves him out of his life. Well, everyone but one. Boom. Tony Wonder, the gay magician. He'd recently become the target of one of Job's schemes to take revenge. After Job comes to the assumption that Tony sabotaged one of his illusions, Job tries to foil one of Tony's one of Tony's own illusions. But after another failed attempt to mess up Tony's show while at a gay club, Tony asks him for a drink and they start talking. Long story short, Job ends up falling in love with him. He falls in love with a man. Something starkly opposite to the persona he's given himself for so long. Something that goes directly against the grain of his father's life. Job no longer wants to take revenge, even if that's what he's trying to convince himself that this whole thing is about. Um, but after learning that the other is straight, they were both pretending to be gay, um, through a very complicated attempt at revenge, they end up sleeping with each other. Uh, which we're gonna do that night regardless, but this is just another example of Job still falling into his habit of, you know, revenge instead of, like, talking to the other person or something. This confirms to Job, though, that his feelings are real. You know, it's not, this isn't some revenge thing. He actually is attracted and loves Tony. And this is something that, you know, Job has pushed down and repressed for his whole life. He says himself that falling in love with Tony is something that he allowed to happen. But, you know, it was all, you know, in the name of revenge. You know, that's what he told himself. It was all in the name of revenge. He didn't actually love him. He, you know, he allowed himself to love Tony, but it was, it was for revenge. You know, he could just tell himself that it was part of this big scheme before now. But, you know, now he knows for certain that his feelings are real. And he doesn't want to know that. Because, you know, he's definitely straight, and he definitely loves women, and, you know, once again, he's running away from actually having to deal with his feelings, deal with his real self, you know? He's running away from someone he loves, you know, someone who actually loves him back, because if he didn't, he'd actually have to reflect on himself, you know, and about the kind of person he is, and the parts of himself that he's, he is always running away from. He'd have to come to the realization that his dad didn't love him before, and he especially won't love him now. He'd have to stop blaming others for his destructive decisions and start taking re responsibility for himself. So, because you know, he can't, he can't continue to be with this man if he doesn't acknowledge those other things because they directly contradict each other. So he decides he's gonna forget, you know, with the forget me now, because, you know, he can't get himself to run away. He can't get himself to not care about Tony. Um, so he decides to forget. But Michael catches Tony in their house and you know, after connecting the dots, Job, instead of facing the shame he feels from, you know, no, having his brother know that he slept with a man, he forces Michael to swallow a forget the forget-me-now. But, you know, once again, he's too ashamed to let anyone see the real him. It's all a part of the cycle. He's just continuing the cycle. And that cycle would have continued if it weren't for the fact that that was his last one. Even if he could get more, it would be too late. It's too late to forget. Now he has to remember. This is the point of improvement. This is what caused Job to be forced to change. Because his feelings are real and there's nothing he can do to get rid of them. Now he has to deal with them. 
it was Joe being forced to remember and face the fact that he loves Tony Wonder that put him on the path to being a better person. Let's think back to, you know, previous seasons. You know, Joe was always sleeping, just lying about sleeping with women. He was always bragging about these women. Joe was always competing with his brother for his dad's attention. You know, Joe was always pushing people away. You know, the people who actually wanted a real connection with him. Joe was always taking pills to forget the people who he couldn't get himself to push away. You know, push away the shame he didn't want to feel. And Job was always taking revenge or getting mad at those who, you know, he'd push away. This was all the result of him being torn between his yearning for a deep connection and yearning for approval from his father. He would oppress his true self, act like a jerk, but still want people to truly love him, you know? And, but, you know, this season, does he really do that stuff? I mean, yes, to an extent, but he, yeah, he does, but there is a drastic change. There's a ch it's much less and much less severe, you know? A thing that I've yet to mention is that Tony Wonder had taken a forget me now and he no longer remembered their night together. Later saying, plus there wasn't a 4th of May this year. That being this night where everything went down. In the scenes leading up to them reuniting for their parade of float illusion, here, Job is clearly devastated because, you know, Tony's been ghosting him ever since that night. You can see him just absolutely, you know, heartbroken. And usually in situations like this, Job gets very angry at the world, the other person himself, and, you know, tries to take revenge. But he doesn't do that here. With the knowledge that his love and attraction to Tony is real, you know, having, you know, thought this through, having to, you know, think about this so much and realize how much he misses Tony, he just wanted to be able to see him again. Job tells Tony, yeah, well, the truth is, this was never about the gig. I did this whole thing just to see you one last time. I don't think I explained this, but Job is pretending to be the Christian magician and... Tony is pretending, pretending to be the gay magician. That's their whole brand. Um, they're different in the same way. It's a whole thing. Um, but yeah, it's because of their public image that they can't be together. Um, this is the part of the reason why Job sets up the parade photo illusion. It involves them both in closets and Job can come out as gay and Tony can come out as straight and then they can go live a life together, no longer being restrained by what they present, portrayed themselves to be. But, and Job ends up coming out as gay, he comes out of his closet, but Tony gets like literally like cemented, like cement poured in there by, um, but you know, also not literally because his death was faked um, into the closet by the gay mafia. It's very complicated. Anyway, um, Job expresses that maybe they don't have to say goodbye and never see each other again. And Tony reciprocates this statement. Um, Nowhere in this interaction is Job trying to make Tony feel bad or prove something or get back at him. He just wants to live a life with Tony. He'd be abandoning everything he brought himself to stand for so he could go just live a life where he's actually happy. Something he was never willing to do in the past. In previous seasons, getting revenge or trying to prove a point or, of any, or anything of the sort, you know, was his main focus. I mean, that's what got him into this situation with Tony in the first place. Another instance of this, you know, in season four, where Job, and Tony for that matter, but with a different thing, has a moment where he can take revenge and ruin one of Tony's masks. He uses masks to, you know, bike for his magic tricks. He can do something, you know, related to his original plan of sabotaging Tony, but he doesn't. And this is even before the whole, you know, having to face his feelings thing. He's had to, he's like, you know, even before then, he's sort of, you know, changing as a person. And, you know, he's had to work throughout and, you know, after that, after the whole that stuff, back to season five, you know, he's had to work through a lot of his feelings. And he cares too much about Tony to let him go. Another thing he no longer does is, you know, sleep around with women and by association, brag about it. A pretty awful, rude, demeaning thing to do. He does try to compensate with his new girlfriend, Joni Beard, but the whole joke of her character is that she's Job's beard. A beard being someone's partner who is used to hide infidelity or, in Job's case, sexual orientation. It's just someone he's using an attempt to overcompensate for the fact that he's realized he's gay and the man who, who he loves has abandoned him and, you know, this fact is very obvious. 
he tries and fails to do his whole bragging about his girlfriend thing, but the narrator, you know, reveals that Job hadn't been with a woman since he'd gotten closer to Tony Wonder. And it's stated that he hadn't done much fooling with it all in regards to Joni. He seems in pain every time he's trying to talk about her in a sexual or romantic manner. Like, after a long couple of seconds of him trying to get himself to speak, um, he finally forces out a yes when he thinks his brother is asking if he's ever slept or done stuff with her. Even Tobias, who's known for speaking in ways that often are known to his oblivious mind, either implies something sexual or implies gay, looks at Job weirdly when Job says, she's my beard now, when referring to Joni. Tobias of I just blew myself fame, who was completely unaware of the fact that when he said that, that it implied anything other than the fact that he just painted himself blue, noticed that what Job said implied something else. Job's become extremely reluctant, and as the season goes on, he becomes less and less willing to try to go back to the way he was before. In a direct parallel to the earlier seasons, Job is asked to sleep with Kitty to get, you know, information, something he's done in the past. But this time, he can't make himself do it. He's basically like pleading to Michael, who's making him do this, for him to not have to do this. And he doesn't end up sleeping or doing anything with her. In fact, he picks up a call from Tony, once again her by the fact that they can't see each other anymore. This happens before the parade float, but after the running away of Tony on their initial night together. Um, he's clearly incredibly uncomfortable with every woman he's in a romantic or sexual situation with. And, you know, him sort of recognizing this in himself, you know, is him moving on from those bad things that he would do in the past, you know? In previous seasons, Job would be constantly keeping up his persona, but he isn't doing this, you know, nearly as extremely as he would before. You know, no matter how hard he tries, he just can't stop thinking about Tony. And, you know, it doesn't help that Tony keeps abandoning him and stuff. You know, they're, they're both still trying to convince themselves they're straight. And there's a lot of internalized homophobia going on. In a way, it's hard to blame them. It's really complicated. Um, but, like, he, he can't get himself to sleep with women. He isn't interested in revenge. And even though he's still showing his, wanting his dad's attention at times, he isn't trying so much to be the person his dad would like. He isn't, like you know, stopping himself from doing the things he would in the past. He isn't doing the things that he would make himself do in the past. He's still going after Tony, no matter how much he tries to convince himself that he's not interested in guys. Job has been working on a lot in regards to himself through the last season, specifically his sexuality. It's something about himself that he's finally confronting and trying to deal with. And he stopped doing a lot of the negative, harmful stuff he used to do as frequently, you know, as a result. He's actually forming a real relationship with someone, however, you know, difficult it may be, and they're repressed, I'm definitely straight states. But one thing I must say is that what he's dealing with Tony is a much more positive thing. Him pursuing this has been difficult, but you know, he hasn't done anything morally wrong here. He hasn't done anything bad to Tony in season five. I mean, if anyone's running away, as Job would usually do, it's Tony. Once again, not really that I can blame him. They're dealing with a lot. Um, so, you know, Job's been doing pretty well this season, but he's still Job. He's done things in the past, in the later episodes, that come back to bite him. Once again, all leading back to that one night with Tony. But, you know, this time, it's from a different angle his actions in regards to Michael. What results from this specific one of his many Job-like actions from that night is where I think, you know, the, his growth is truly put on display. Because, you know, acknowledging your sexuality doesn't make you unable to be a garbage person. Through a series of events, Michael ends up remembering what happened, and in front of a court of people, Job is revealed to have drugged Michael during the night being discussed in court. It's being discussed for reasons unrelated to the whole Michael being drugged for realizing Job and Tony slept together thing. But he's been revealed to have, you know, done bad stuff before. He's dead, been done bad stuff in front of other people. And yet he's never changed. I mean, I mentioned this earlier, you know, in the episode with Job's bachelor party, Job is trying to, you know, convince his accountant that he killed a stripper per his dad's request, you know, to get him out of, to get the accountant out of town, you know, because he wants his dad's approval. And after failing to do this, you know, even though he feels like a failure, Michael gives him the whole talk about their dad being trash, you know, he goes immediately back to acting badly. He ends up, for just no reason at all, other than wanting to 
do a little silly prank on his brother. He convinces Buster, uh, who had drunk too much juice, that he killed the stripper. For, for no reason. He just go, you know, immediately goes back to acting the way he used to. And another instance I mentioned, you know, as I said earlier, with when Job's ca son calls him out on being a bad person, he just gets mad at his son. He's like, and thanks for none of the birthday cards I got for the last 40 years. His son didn't even know about him. And his son is like, I don't know, like not a, like a little older than 19, I think. It's like maybe like 20 something. <laughs> it's not even a valid thing to be angry about, nor is his anger at his son valid in the first place. He's just getting mad for no reason other than the fact that he doesn't want to confront the fact and feel, you know, shame about him actually being in the wrong. But here, after, you know, the after the development that he's had, after that, since that fateful night, he's exposed in front of these people as someone who's done something bad, actually bad, you know, drugging a person, a hot take, bad thing. <laughs> Um, and not only that, but it was to Michael, and despite what he tries to convince himself of otherwise, he knows Michael is one of the only people he has who's truly there for him. Well, in the last episode, he's shown calling out to Michael, trying to get his attention. He looks like he genuinely, truly wants to talk, but Michael ignores him or doesn't hear him and keeps walking, understandably so. Um, you can hear, you know, Job's tone is serious, regretful, and I think he's, you know, going to try to reconcile things with him. He isn't avoiding the problem like he usually does. He's directly trying to deal with the issue. And it's an issue involving personal shame and regret about something he actually did wrong. That's genuine evidence of growth. He doesn't, he hasn't been shown to ever do that in like the old seasons, you know? While we don't get to see what it is, you know, he wants to tell Michael, I can say that, you know, based on tone and what's, you know, has been going on, it's pretty clear that it's the whole drugging him thing that he wants to try to reach out to him, you know, and apologize for. If this were any other season, he'd be taking a forget me now instead of communicating and dealing with the pain of knowing he's hurt a loved one, you know, knowing that he messed up. He'd be upset at Michael for being reasonably upset with him. But, you know, Job wants to show he's sorry and that he wants to move past it. He truly cares about his brother and he doesn't want to lose the only friend he has, you know. But it's too late. His brother has left, not even saying goodbye to his family. Once again, understandably so. But despite the attempt at interaction being unsuccessful, it still shows he wanted to do something about it. And that, at least in this case, you know, with Job, is incredibly significant. And it was, start it was by starting to deconstruct and, you know, f figure out his sexuality that he was able to get to this point. It was the first swing at breaking down his facade. Because his sexuality encompassed so much of his abhorrent behavior and a lot of why he was so unhappy, by beginning to break that down, it took a lot of the stuff, off, you know, other stuff with it. It made him realize, oh, maybe apologizing, you know, to my brother is a good thing. Maybe doing this is a good thing. Maybe I should act like a better person, you know? And that initial crack in the wall, the facade he built for himself, gave him space to try to break through even more. Apologize. You know, it made it easier to take another swing. It isn't so, you know, monumental. It isn't so, like, impossible to break through anymore. He sees that he can get through it, however difficult it may be. He isn't completely free, but you know, he's still he's still stuck in a lot of ways, but he's getting there and he's realizing how much better it feels than burying himself away and closing himself off from others. Job's situation isn't an easy fix. You can't just stop being affected by lifelong trauma. That's not how it works. Um, George and Lucille Bluth are incredibly manipulative, horrible people you know, who have raised and treated their children horribly in a multitude of ways. Michael, who is arguably the most functional out of the siblings, has immense pressure on him and his family takes advantage of the fact that he constantly feels pressure to clean up their messes. You know, he was basically, he was not given a childhood. He was like brought up to disregard himself and do anything for the company and the family. Lindsay was constantly, you know, criticized and shamed for her looks, being dis dismissed by her mother, the only positive attention, you know, being her treated like a trophy by her father, and now lacks a lot of self-confidence and is always trying to gain others' approval. 
Job, as I've mentioned over and over, you know, is, you know, was criticized heavily and called a failure by his dad and was constantly compared to his brother. Their, you know, rivalry being actively encouraged by their father. Like, he would, like, like, evo like be like, oh, uh, did you hear that Michael did this bad thing that would make you angry? And then he would go to Job and be like, did you, or he would go to Michael and be like, oh, did you hear Job did this thing that made you angry? And he would encourage them to, like, beat each other up. It's horrible. And, and then Buster, you know, was sheltered so severely by his mother that, you know, it led to him having horrible anxiety and no sense of self or independence, leaving him with no way to survive in the real world, you know, and having to stay with his mother, who, you know, keeps perpetuating his inability to survive on his own and become his own person. And it's not as if their parents aren't aware of their trauma and what they've done to them. Lucille and George, you know, they, you know, they use their children's trauma to their advantage in order to manipulate them into doing things. Like, as I said earlier, you know, he's aware that Job desperately wants his approval. So he, like, you know, he used, you know, he paid attention to Job, making him think that, you know, for the bachelor party thing, he made him think that, like, oh, you know, made Job think, oh, he's finally giving me attention. Now, you know, we gotta keep doing this and stuff like that. I gotta keep doing this because he's actually... This is good now because I want his attention and he, he manipulates his, you know, and, and all, all of his children, he manipulates them in order to make, and uses their weaknesses that they created. Like, the reason all of them are so, are just stuck in these loops, you know, the arrested development is, big, you know, it leads all back to their parents. So, you know, while Joe may not have been perfect this last season, the steps he took were massive and finally were putting him in the right direction. It's sad that it, you know, took him literally not being able to drug himself to forget, to get him to actually face, you know, who he is and face his own faults. But if it works, it works. Because in my opinion, without that, I don't think he would have changed. I think he would have, you know, kept going, ruining his life bit by bit until it killed him. And that's why the improvement he had as a character in season five means so much. Yes, Joe may still sometimes try to push himself back into that persona, but there was also that moment where he tried to reach out to Michael, apologize. He may be extremely repressed and he's still trying to convince himself and others that he's straight, but you know, as Tony and Job said when they reunited in the last episode, you know, they spoke together, they're, st they're still gonna be doing stuff together even if they're take, you know, moving slowly through it all. Yes, Joe might still be yearning for his father's approval, but he's going directly against what would get him, you know, that in so many of his actions throughout the last season. He falls victim to, you know, his need to fall back into his role, but Job is taking steps that will eventually get him the happiness he always wanted. Job is, once again, being torn between two worlds, but this time, He's actually taking action on trying to be a better person instead of just wishing things would be better without ever trying. And the way he, you know, he acted in the past is much more of a persona than it ever was because in the moments where it really matters, he takes off the mask. He's truly been trying to change his ways. And if he hopes to ever, you know, reconnect once again and be friends with his brother, if he wants to continue seeing Tony and come to terms with the fact that he loves a man, and that's okay. If he wants to continue to form genuine connections instead of pushing everyone away, he's going to have to stop seeking his father's approval. Because if those worlds collide, he's going to have to choose how he's going to act. And that's where the real change occurs. You know, back to the facade metaphor, he can't keep tearing down that wall and hoping it'll stand. You know, because, and because of what he's already, already destroyed, it'll never be able to stand like it did before. It's, it'll keep wobbling until it falls apart. It's eventually going to crumble. He's on the path to being a better person. He's taking the steps to improve himself. You can see it happening over the fifth season. His growth as a character, him, you know, starting to break out of his, of the mask, of the, you know, persona he built for himself. And that's really cool. And, you know, that'll lead him towards the life that he truly wants. And it's all thanks to that fateful night and that pesky pill that Job's Blue's character development was let out of jail. Because it's unarrested.